Why do I keep returning to Fallout 4? Why do I always find myself going back to this bug riddled mess of a game when I could be trying new games instead? Why do I always hover over the game in my library, doing my best to resist the urge to install it again the same way one stops themselves before texting an X? It's a game I've started and stopped several times, but for some reason I just can never be fully done with it. Fallout 4, developed by Bethesda Game Studios, is an incredibly popular game that is as widely beloved as it is hated. It's a divisive game that I have a bit of a checkered history with. As someone who is a fan of both Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas, yes, I'm one of those people, I excitedly purchased Fallout 4 on day one for PC when it arrived in 2015. I played it for a few hours, but for whatever reason it didn't take me long to lose momentum and move on to another game. A few years later, I felt inspired to reinstall the game and give it another shot. I started a new game, played it longer than I did the first time around, but after a while I fizzled out on it, just like before. Yeah, I can't wait to fire up some nuclear grenades and... What the fuck was that? This cycle of reinstalling, playing for a little bit, and then bailing would repeat for me several times. Every few years, I would feel a strong desire to try Fallout 4 again, only to abandon it a week or two later. Why was this happening? What is it about Fallout 4 that is so compelling, but ultimately, to me, unfulfilling? There are so many other games in my backlog that I've been meaning to go back to, or in some cases games I've already purchased but just haven't tried yet. I could start any one of those games, so why do I keep reinstalling fucking Fallout 4 instead? Why does this game that I continuously bounce off of always get another chance? Why does it keep bringing me back? We have to go back! This is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and I'd like to explore the ins and outs of my experience with Fallout 4 in order to get to the bottom of this phenomenon. If you're a fan of Fallout 4 and are about to stop this video because you're not interested in hearing some random guy on the internet rant about how Fallout 4 is a pile of shit and that everything you like is actually horrible, I would consider holding off on that for now. There are many reasons why Fallout 4 is so appealing and I will absolutely be giving the game its flowers. Conversely, if you have a heart of stone and hate Fallout 4 and just love watching the world burn, don't worry, I'll still be talking a little trash as well. I like to think that this video will have a little something for everyone. I'm sure that many of you are interested in Fallout because of the recent TV series on Amazon, and I'm no exception. I'll admit the show is the main reason why I wanted to give the game another whirl this year. My current playthrough of Fallout 4 in 2024 gave me a fresh perspective on the game and caused me to reassess my initial criticisms that I had. However, in order to examine the reasons why I kept installing, uninstalling, and reinstalling the game over the years, I think we have to look at how we got here to begin with. So with all that being said, let's take a deeper look and try to figure out what it is about Fallout 4 that keeps pulling me back in. <laughs> Whoops. My opinion of Fallout 4 has evolved over the years, but I think it's worthwhile to revisit what it felt like the first time I played. As the saying goes, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Back in 2015, I had a PC that would be considered pretty decent at the time. It had a GTX 960 graphics card, an AMD FX processor, 16 gigs of RAM on a 1080p monitor. Pretty humble by today's standards, but I could still play most games at high settings without issue. Just as a reference, a year later I'd be playing Doom 2016 and Titanfall 2 at a buttery smooth 60fps on the same PC. When I fired up Fallout 4 for the first time, I remember things not running very well. So I turned the settings down to either medium or low. God rays off, of course. After that, performance seemed acceptable, mostly hovering around 60 FPS. But unfortunately, while the game was certainly playable, I remember also thinking that it looked pretty ugly with all the settings turned down. That's all fine though, I mean, at least I got the thing running and I was off on my first Fallout 4 adventure. The next thing that stood out to me was the dialogue. Not the writing quality per se, but the system in which the dialogue is presented to the player. Instead of being able to see exactly what your character will say in a response, as it was in all previous Fallout games, this time the response options are truncated to just a word or a short phrase. After you select a response, your character will say a longer sentence that the player wasn't privy to. This leads to moments where your character's response feels misrepresented in the options screen. Sometimes the option will just say something like, sarcastic. Like, what the fuck does that mean? Sarcastic how? Sarcastic in like, an insulting way? Oh, were those your guys? <laughs> I thought they were just trying to throw me a barbecue. Or does it mean like, playfully sarcastic the way you would be with friends? Will it be like that night in the park a year ago? Since you don't know what your character is going to be sarcastic about, this results in your character saying something that you might not have wanted to say. 
Part of the fun with these kinds of RPGs is having the agency over what kind of vibe your character gives off. But if you don't know exactly what you're going to be saying, it's difficult to have the same feeling of control over your character's actions. I certainly wasn't the only one who felt this way, of course. This ended up being a major critique of the game among Fallout fans. It didn't take long before someone did the work and put out a mod that changed the dialogue select screens back to the classic way of seeing the entire response written out. We'll be getting more into mods a bit later in the video, but for now let's just say this is just the tip of the iceberg of the work that the modding community put in to fix the game as they saw it. The other thing that I remember about my first time playing Fallout 4 was the main storyline. It was pretty neat to start off the game in a time before things inevitably fell to shit, giving us a rare glimpse of the clean version of the patented retro aesthetic world. After a slightly dull but brief character customization, the player experiences an exciting sequence where the alarm sound off and your family makes it to the vault just moments before the bombs go off. Pretty cool. It's a fresh take on the beginning of a Fallout game. As long as you can put aside the massive convenience of being offered a spot on the vault literally minutes before the bombs are dropped. Either way, I thought it was a pretty solid start. For comparison, I started a new game in Fallout 3 to get some footage for this video, and holy fucking shit, I couldn't believe how long the intro section took. I remember the whole starting the game from birth gimmick being pretty cool when I first played it, but when you have to sit through the stupid birthday party, take the school test, then learn how to shoot a BB gun and all that other dumb shit again on subsequent playthroughs, it's insufferably long. Bonus points to Fallout 4 for keeping things relatively brief, especially compared to Fallout 3. Anyway, the next thing that happens in Fallout 4 is seeing your spouse get murdered and your baby get kidnapped, and it becomes clear that the main storyline is going to center around finding your baby. On paper, this sounds like strong enough motivation for your character, but right away there are some problems with that storyline. First off, it seemed eerily similar to the plot of Fallout 3. In that game, you're searching for your dad, and now in Fallout 4, you're searching for your baby. Huh. Seems like they could have broadened their horizons and gone with something at least a little more different than they did in the last game. But the real issue with the whole searching for a loved one questline in an open world RPG is that it can clash hard with the gameplay. When your character is off wandering aimlessly, looting abandoned stores, building a house, flirting with strangers, planting gardens, boxing against robots, browsing abandoned comic book stores, and generally fucking around, it feels a little weird because your character is supposed to be frantically searching for their son. It might work better if you're the type of player who stays focused on the main quest and are determined to solve the mystery of your missing child, but let's face it, that's not how the vast majority of people play this game. The game itself doesn't feel designed to be played that way. The game throws so much compelling side stuff at the player that it seems like it was an intended design choice to make the player a bad parent. For example, one of the first thing that happens for a lot of players in Fallout 4 is meeting up with Preston Garvey in Concord. Even though we all know Garvey is largely a do-nothing nobody who talks big game while offloading most of the hard work to the player, I have my own problems, Garvey. He also feels like a major character in the story. I'm guessing most players will at least start the quest line of building up the Minutemen, which of course leads to the sequence of acquiring your first set of power armor and battling your first Deathclaw. It all feels big and important. And since this happened so early in the game, it kind of feels like the main quest of the game. It's kind of easy to forget that you're actually supposed to be out there searching for your baby, not running around doing errands for fucking Preston Garvey. It may not be a chest full of emeralds, but it'll have to do. None of this is to even say that the main story is bad at all. It's totally fine and it gets a little bit more interesting the farther you get in. But the early thrust of searching for your son seems at odds with the open world nature of the game, as it feels like it's buried among the ubiquitous side content. And look, I'm aware this is all well-trodden ground. I mean, the game is nine years old at this point and has been picked apart and analyzed to death. But this was my initial reaction to the game before it had any kind of reputation. So these things I just described, the ugliness, the lackluster dialogue system, the main quest issues, they all contributed to this generally underwhelming feeling that led to me abandoning the game after just a few hours. I didn't make like a hard decision to stop playing. It wasn't some kind of defiant mic drop or dramatic statement of disappointment. Hell, at the time, I didn't even know I was abandoning the game. I just quit out once and assumed I'd come back the next day or so, but I never did. Fallout 4 failed to uphold my excitement in the early game, and my attention just moved on to other games. I didn't know it then, but it would end up being several years before I would return. In October of 2018, I was in San Jose, California, attending TwitchCon with my friend and Time Magazine's Man of the Year, Cal Cronin. We walked around the convention floor and arrived at a booth promoting Fallout 76, the upcoming multiplayer iteration of Fallout that Bethesda was working on. We watched some early footage of the game, and it looked pretty cool. 
Unfortunately, we all know how that turned out, but prior to its horrendous launch, it did look like a pretty cool game. My friend Cal asked me what I thought of Fallout. He hadn't played any game in the series and wondered if it was something that was worth his time. As I described what I liked about the Fallout games, the isolation, the sense of danger, the mid-century retro-future aesthetic, the stellar soundtracks, the dark sense of humor, the environmental storytelling, the wacky hijinks, my mind began to reflect on my experience with Fallout 4. I never really gave that game a fair shake, did I? I had some issues with it, sure, but why hadn't I gone back to see what else the game had to offer? It had a mixed reception from fans, but a lot of people seemed to really like it as well, so there had to be some amount of worthwhile content in the game. Enough time had passed and I had began to wonder if my initial criticism was petty and overblown. The dialogue system was different from previous games, so what? Was that really a huge deal? The game didn't look super great on my PC, but was that a good enough reason to skip out on experiencing a massive and interesting open world RPG? Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas weren't exactly high marks for graphical beauty either. Plus, these games take place in a post-apocalypse. They aren't exactly supposed to look pretty all the time. On top of that, it's not like Fallout 4 was unplayable. It ran decently enough on my PC at low and medium settings, which was totally acceptable. As for the main quest, sure, it didn't exactly pull me in much, but was that even a problem? The best parts of other Bethesda games like Skyrim and Oblivion were the side quests, so maybe that's the part I should have focused on while playing Fallout 4. Plus, I grew up in Massachusetts. There aren't too many games that take place in fucking Boston, kid. And the fact that there was a post-apocalyptic fucking fantasy game that takes place in the fucking Commonwealth, bro? That's wicked fucking cool. You need a genuine, authentic, custom-made hickory swatter. By the time I returned home from TwitchCon, I was highly motivated to reinstall Fallout 4 and give it a fresh start. It was finally time to return to the wasteland and see what I was missing out on the first time I played. This time around, I wasn't going to be focusing as much on comparing it to other Fallout games. I was going to be doing my best to experience the game on its own right. Admittedly, it was easier to do this by 2018 because it had been about eight years since Fallout 3 in New Vegas, and those experiences had all but faded away in my brain. I began a new game of Fallout 4, and once again I watched the bombs go off, witnessed my baby boy getting kidnapped, and bumped into that crazy old scalawag Preston Garvey. I made an effort not to be bothered by the sometimes misleading dialogue options. I also paid more attention to some of the gameplay mechanics in Fallout 4 that weren't in previous games. This is going to make me sound stupid, but I swear to God, I had no recollection of the crafting, cooking, or building systems from my previous time playing. Ruined house? Can we scrap the whole house? Oh, fuck. I guess that shows how quickly I bounced off, or perhaps how close-minded I was. But these are pretty major aspects of the game that I either missed or ignored completely the first time around. I'll dive into detail about the whole crafting aspect of the game a little later in the video, but for now I'll just say that I enjoyed customizing weapons and armor during this playthrough, and it absolutely enhanced my experience. I tinkered around with the base building stuff briefly, but I quickly abandoned it because it felt a little janky and wasn't exactly something I wanted to do when I could be out there exploring the open world instead. Already I was having a much better time with Fallout 4 than I did before. I really embraced wandering off into a random direction to see what kind of discoveries and danger awaited me. The written story took a backseat to my own story that I created as I explored the massive map of the Commonwealth. The first time I played, I focused on the things that weren't working for me and that I didn't like, especially compared to the prior Fallout games. Now that I was enjoying myself more, I took notice of a few things about the game that were nice improvements from the previous entries in the series. First off, the way in which the player loots items from containers and bodies has been streamlined, which seems subtle at first, but it ends up being a major improvement. In Fallout 3 and New Vegas, you'd have to select a locker or box or whatever, and the game would pause as the list of items in the container would be displayed. You'd select which items you wanted to transfer into your inventory or hit the take all button. There's nothing wrong with this on its own, but these games will have you looking through containers or bodies for loot constantly. People like to think of Fallout as a series about world building, storytelling, choices, sharp dialogue, and of course, bloody violence. In reality, however, 3D Fallout entries are actually mostly about rummaging through every nook and cranny for that sweet, sweet loot. Find an interesting new area? Time to dig through every desk, box, and locker for ammo and other valuables. Just get into a firefight? Time to search every single body on the ground. Crack the code on a computer terminal or pick a hard locked door? Time to enter the newly unlocked room and sweep every shelf, table, and surface for anything that isn't bolted to the ground. If there was a pie chart of time spent on the various activities that you do in Fallout, the largest portion of the graph for me would unquestionably be looting and collecting junk. The pacing of Fallout 3 and New Vegas take a hit with the amount of time the game pauses for you to search each container. 
The worst part is that sometimes you look into a container, the game will pause, and then you'll see a list of items only to find nothing that you want to take. Again, I know this doesn't sound like a big deal, but when this is an action you do constantly, that pause time adds up. In Fallout 4, they introduced a new system that speeds things along. Now when you move your reticle over a lootable container, a list of items appears without stopping the game, and you can take the items you want while barely skipping a beat. This means you can look at a locker or whatever and quickly determine whether or not it contains something worth taking. So now when you commit mass murder and it's time to capitalize on the loot your victims left behind, you can rake in the goods in a matter of seconds. Considering the frequency in which the player will be looting various containers, this is a much welcome quality of life improvement. Speaking of improvements, another thing that is much more polished in Fallout 4 is the overall fluidity of movement, the game feel, if you will. This applies to both the combat as well as the general character movement. To say that the real-time combat in Fallout 3 is a little clunky is being way too generous. Using ranged weapons in that game felt like someone created a slapdash gun mod for Oblivion. It didn't feel great, especially when using a controller on the console version of the game, which is how I played. This issue, of course, was mitigated by the VATS targeting system, which essentially let the player fight using turn-based combat instead. This solution worked pretty well as far as I was concerned, but there was also a feeling that the game could have been better if the real-time gunplay was a more viable option. In Fallout 4, the real-time combat is not only viable, it's actually pretty fun. The shooting feels good, the gore is cartoonishly over the top, and the combat encounters are more enjoyable because of it. I mean, let's not go crazy, it still has plenty of jank. It doesn't feel quite as smooth or as good as pure first-person shooters do, but it's still a big step up for the series. VATS is still available to use, and it's a good option for when you want to hit specific body parts or land critical hits, but this time it doesn't pause, it merely slows down, which keeps the player on their toes during combat situations. Oh! Sorry, dog! Even outside of combat, the feeling of just walking around the open world has a smoother and more natural feel than it did in previous games. It's hard to describe really, but it's something you definitely notice if you've played Fallout 3 or New Vegas. When you combine the streamlined loot system, the improved game feel, add in a cohesive art design, pour it on a vast and intriguing map, then sprinkle on some atmosphere, baby, now you got a stew going. The vibes were solid, but after all that, I ended up bailing after 15 hours. Um, excuse me, sir. You just said a second ago that you were enjoying Fallout 4. You literally just did a whole thing about everything working well and that there was a stew going and stuff. And now you're bailing on it? That doesn't make any sense at all. What about all those nice things you said? What could possibly cause you to bounce off of the game? <sighs> yeah, most of you probably knew this was coming. After all, this is a Bethesda game we're talking about here. Fallout 4 is rife with technical issues and bugs, ranging from small and occasionally hilarious physics glitches to performance slowdowns and game-breaking crashes. Well, the game just crashed, so... I experienced the entire rainbow of problems during my second playthrough attempt. By the way, just a quick side note, I don't have any footage from my old playthrough attempts, so the footage you'll be seeing here doesn't reflect the exact issues that I experienced at the time. So I'm just gonna show some regular gameplay footage for this section. Just bear with me here as I go into some technical issues without being able to show you what I actually experienced. I know I just played a clip of the game crashing, but that was actually from a live stream I did earlier this year, so game crashing bugs are still alive and well, baby. Back in 2018, I was still using the PC that I built back in 2014, and as previously mentioned, I managed to get a mostly solid 60 FPS by keeping the settings on low and medium. That seemed to be working well enough until I made it to the early quest at the Corvega assembly plant, where the frame rate began to dip well under 60. It was annoying, but still playable, so I tried to do my best to ignore it. By the time I got to downtown Boston, specifically Diamond City, the frame rate tanked to under 30 and I started to lose my patience. Performance issues aren't exactly a new thing with Fallout 4. However, I played Fallout 3 on Xbox 360, and since there wasn't really a way to change the graphics settings, I was resigned to thinking, it is what it is, and I knew I couldn't really do anything to fix it. This also holds true for anyone who played Fallout 4 on console, but since I was playing on PC, I was convinced there was a magical combination of settings I could tweak in order to get things running smoothly. Anyone who knows me is well aware that I have a tendency to fall down rabbit holes of tweaking settings and getting caught up in finding the best options in PC games. I've been known to comb through forum upon forum to find just the right settings to improve my gameplay experience. This isn't inherently a bad thing, but once I cross the threshold of spending more time tweaking settings than actually playing the game, it probably isn't worth it in the end. 
With that said, playing Bethesda games on PC can be a bad combination for me. After spending a considerable amount of time messing around with different options, I landed on a solution that slightly improved the frame rate in the denser urban areas of Fallout 4. I couldn't help but be pretty annoyed about the lack of optimization going on in this game. Sure, I wasn't on a high-end PC, but considering the game was released only a few months after I built that PC, it felt like a game that I should have been able to get running better. Either way, I figured out a fix and I was getting back into actually playing the game again. Suddenly, the game hard crashed the desktop. I reloaded my save, played for a few seconds, only to have it crash again. I loaded up an older save that didn't crash, but it was three or four hours earlier in the game and therefore I would have lost a lot of progress. Somewhere between the FPS issues, the hard crashes, and the prospect of losing hours of progress, I decided fuck it and moved on to more stable games. I mentioned earlier that the game feel and fluidity is much improved in Fallout 4, but that good game feel is kind of irrelevant if the end result is a game that still frequently stutters or crashes. I can hear many of you behind your screen yelling, you should use mods, idiot! I know. Anyone who's played a 3D Fallout game or any Bethesda game knows about mods. For many years, the modding community has provided an extensive amount of bug fixes, gameplay enhancements, performance tweaks, and many other changes that might improve the playing experience. There are some truly impressive things that have been accomplished by talented modders, and it's absolutely worth exploring what there is out there. Earlier when I said I found a solution to slightly improve the FPS in downtown Boston, I was referring to the Boston FPS Fix mod. But using mods comes at a cost. If you're willing to pay the cost, mods can be an incredibly useful and worthwhile way to improve your time playing Fallout 4. So what do I mean by pay the cost? Let's break it down. First up is time and effort. On consoles, it's not too bad. You can pull up a list of mods from an in-game menu, but it only shows you a small sample of mods that are available. If you're on PC, you'll probably need to modify INI files, download a mod manager, or manually keep track of mod files, change a bunch of command lines, stuff like that. It takes time to research the right mods, carefully read the instructions, and figure out how to pull off all these steps correctly. Some people can do this kind of thing in their sleep, so it's no big deal. For other less technically minded people, it can be a major hassle on top of a relatively steep learning curve. Next up, compatibility. Do you have all the DLCs? Oh, you only have one or two of them? Which ones? Do you have the unofficial patch? Are you using a script extender? What's your load order? Have you installed the next generation update or did you roll it back to the previous version? These are just some of the things you will need to consider when downloading and activating mods. Since there are so many variables with user-generated content, it's a massive tangled web of compatibility issues that needs to be solved. And it's not even a certain thing that there even is a solution. When my game started hard crashing to the desktop, I wasn't sure if it was because of the game or because of the combination of mods I had installed. Scientists will never even know the answer to that one. Next we have achievements. Using mods will change your save file and add the scarlet letter M next to your name. This lets the game know that your save file is modded and prevents you from earning achievements. I know many other people are cool and don't give a fuck about achievements, but sadly I'm not cool enough to be above liking achievements. I'll admit, I want them. All of them. Well, not really all of them per se, I don't really care enough to get every achievement in a game, not by a long shot actually, but still, I like getting them. Anyway, you can't get achievements anymore when you use mods. And yes, I can hear you behind your screen telling me, um, actually, sir, there is in fact a mod that re-enables achievements. I know, there is in fact a mod that re-enables achievements, but that's another mod you'll need to find and add to the complex puzzle of mod compatibility I mentioned earlier. Next up, we have, of course, the risk of corrupting your save file. Enough said there. Another cost of using mods is a relatively new one, cross-saving with the Steam Deck. Hey, so this game actually plays really well on the Steam Deck. I've mostly been playing on PC, but it's been fun to be able to squeeze in a little more Fallout before bed on the deck. Whatever modding I do on PC, I would have to replicate on the Steam Deck, and that means using Linux, which means more time and effort. I'm probably missing a few things, but to my understanding, this is the cost. If you're willing to deal with all that, mods can be excellent. It really just comes down to whether or not you're willing to put in a little extra work and tweak some things. I can go both ways on mods, because I see their value, but if you just want mods to fix performance issues like I do, it seems like kind of a pain in the ass just to get something working the way it should have been working out of the box. I've used them in the past with some success, but as previously mentioned, for me it can also result in spending more time fixated on performance than actually playing the game. After my second failed attempt to play Fallout 4, a few more years went by. Over that time I got a new PC, and at some point I reinstalled the game, 
but I only played the first hour or so before getting sidetracked with something else, so I wouldn't even say that qualifies as a legitimate playthrough attempt. For a while I didn't think about Fallout much at all, until 2023 when Bethesda came out with their latest open world RPG, Starfield. I was debating whether or not to bring up Starfield for this video, but I decided that it does factor into my opinion of Fallout. Plus, sometimes it's fun to talk a little shit. I'm not going to do a whole review of Starfield here, so let's just boil it down to this. Starfield isn't a bad game, but in some ways it's worse than a bad game. It's a boring game. It was pitched and marketed as this large-scale space adventure with tons of planets and strange worlds to explore, but the actual space exploration turned out to be supremely lackluster, and mostly just consists of fast traveling and loading screens. The infamously half-baked No Man's Sky launch in 2016 featured more interesting space travel, and that's really saying something. Starfield looked pretty good graphically, and I particularly liked a lot of the weapon skins, but underneath that shiny coat of paint is the classic Bethesda RPG system, for better or worse. At first I thought this was totally acceptable, because it had been a while since I had had one of those Bethesda-style adventures and I was kind of in the mood for one. I played for maybe 25 hours, and I couldn't help but think that it all felt a little hollow. Again, I want to emphasize that I don't think the game is bad, and I still had a lot of really good moments with it, but it just felt like an Elder Scrolls or Fallout game just without the charm. One of the best aspects of a Bethesda RPG is the random stuff that happens to you in between the quests. You might be walking to the next checkpoint in a mission when you see a weird cave or a building or another point of interest that leads to something fun and unexpected. So when you have a Bethesda RPG that largely replaces the travel portion of the game with loading screens, a lot of that fun is gone. The overall art design and aesthetic of Starfield was also a bit bland for my taste, bordering on generic. This might have been okay if there was some exciting space adventures, but there wasn't really. It gave me a new appreciation for the aesthetic and vibes that were present in the Fallout games. I didn't realize how important the quirky, retro-future, mid-century look was to the whole experience until I played Starfield. In fact, there were several times while playing Starfield that I thought to myself, I should just be playing Fallout instead. At least there's some more life, energy, and humor in those games. Once I inevitably bounced off of Starfield, I stared at my copy of Fallout 4 in my Steam library. It was just sitting there, waiting for me to install it once more. Why shouldn't I take another romp through the post-nuclear commonwealth? But then I thought about the previous time I actually played it. The performance problems, the not-so-compelling story, the misleading dialogue system, the juggling of different mods, the jank, the crashes. I couldn't help but focus on the negative aspects of the game again. I knew it would probably run better on my beefier PC, but I don't know. I couldn't help but wonder if it was even worth investing time into at this point. So yeah, Starfield made me appreciate Fallout, but it wasn't enough to outweigh the negative feelings I held for the game. I mean, did I actually want to jump through all the hoops to get everything running properly? I had already installed it on three different occasions and it could never really hook me, whether it was for gameplay or technical reasons. Maybe it just wasn't that good of a game and I wasn't really missing anything. Yeah, that must be it. Instead of installing it again, I decided that it was easier to conclude that Fallout 4 and I just weren't meant to be, and perhaps I should just let it go for good. And that's the end of my Fallout 4 story. Well, at least it would have been the end if it weren't for an unexpected event that happened in the spring of 2024. In the spring of 2024, Amazon released a Fallout TV show created by Geneva Robertson Dwaret and Graham Wagner and produced by Jonathan Nolan. I hadn't read much about it leading up to its debut and I didn't really hear any buzz about it either. So it kind of felt like it came out of nowhere. Turns out it was pretty good. The world of Fallout has always been fertile soil for stories and adventure to take place, but that doesn't mean that it would automatically translate well into a TV show. The reason the TV show worked is mostly due to a lot of smart decisions that were made by the showrunners, perhaps most importantly focusing on the characters. It wouldn't have been too hard to just hire a cheap cast and crew, cram in lots of game references, have some cool action set pieces, and then just push out the slop in a trough for the pigs to devour but it probably wouldn't have been very well received. Instead, they wisely hired talented writers and directors who shaped the story around three likable characters who had their own satisfying arcs. Outside of a brief but unwelcome appearance from Michael Rappaport, I thought the creative decisions to bring Fallout to the small screen were well thought out and successful. Perhaps the smartest decision of all was to give ample screen time to Walton Goggins, a guy who would have off the charts charisma stats if he were a character in a Fallout game. The show got to have its cake and eat it too, because although they hired good talent and focused on the characters and the story, they also got to cram in lots of references to the game without being overly distracting. 
There are too many to list here, but one of my favorite little details was the comically oversized bags of equipment that the Brotherhood Squires had to lug around, which was a fun nod to item encumbrance in the games. It wasn't the greatest show ever made, or even close to that, but it didn't have to be. It was a solid show that exceeded any expectations I would have had for a Fallout TV show. There was also a major benefit of having a Fallout story through the medium of TV that wasn't possible in the games. Zero technical problems. For the first time ever, I got to experience a Fallout adventure without game-breaking bugs. I'm happy to report that the show played back at a consistent frame rate and didn't crash a single time on my TV. In fact, there wasn't a single instance where I lost hours of progress and had to start the show over. This is a big step forward for the series. One of the major outcomes of the show's success has been the general rekindling of interest in the Fallout universe. Many people, myself included, got Fallout fever and felt the sudden desire to go back to the games and experience their own adventures. I'm guessing a decent portion of the people watching this video are here because the show ignited your interest in all things Fallout. After watching the show, most of my negative feelings toward the Fallout franchise washed away, and I wanted to go back to the wasteland once more. Since Bethesda was hilariously underprepared for this predictable uptick of excitement for Fallout and had nothing prepared to go along with the release of the show, people had no choice but to go into the back catalog of older Fallout games to quench their thirst. Yes, they did eventually put out a next-gen update for Fallout 4, but it seemed pretty half-baked and mostly caused more problems than it solved. So once again, I thought about Fallout 4. That familiar feeling came back to me that I experienced several times before the desire to go back to the Commonwealth. I again thought about how I hadn't gotten too far and never got to experience most of what the game had in store. Sure, New Vegas would undoubtedly be fun to revisit, but I had already played it and therefore it would be kind of just like reliving an experience I already had. My previous playthroughs of Fallout 4 had mostly been derailed by technical issues, but now I had a decent PC that could probably power through some of the performance problems. So maybe now was the time, while I had favorable thoughts about the Fallout franchise, to give it one more shot. I couldn't believe I was about to install Fallout 4 and give it another chance instead of trying something new, but I just couldn't help it. The world of Fallout 4 was calling back to me and there was only one way to satisfy my desires. I fired it up once more. This time I was fully prepared to bounce off of it after a few hours, just like I always had. I was thinking about how this game always pulled me back in, but never delivered. I was thinking about how I would probably end up going back to New Vegas after this game inevitably would disappoint me again. Then something happened that I didn't expect. It wasn't a single moment or one specific thing, but I found myself getting absorbed in the vibes of the world. I found myself embracing the crafting and the building systems. I found myself thinking about the game when I wasn't playing. Most importantly, I was finally able to use settings that didn't cause performance issues or crashes. For this recent playthrough, everything clicked. And I gotta say, I kinda love it. Who would have thought? But after all these stops and starts, I actually think Fallout 4 is pretty awesome. All I was missing back in 2015 was a time machine, so I could go to the future and get a PC powerful enough to compensate for the abysmal optimization. Seriously, I cannot overstate how playing this game at a steady 60 FPS on ultra settings makes a world of difference. It's funny to think that one of my first impressions of the game was that it was ugly, because as I'm playing now, I often find the game to be downright gorgeous. The god rays are taxing to have on, but man, they really add to the serene beauty that is on display while wandering around the Commonwealth. There are still plenty of times when the game rears its ugly head and looks rough as hell, particularly with character models and indoor environments, or when textures just straight up fail to load and the highway has the appearance of some kind of amorphous gray goo. However, I think the game is pleasant to look at for the vast majority of the time. And this is a nine-year-old game we're talking about, so its graphical shortcomings can be largely forgiven. All that being said, I was stunned to discover that even on a more powerful PC, I still experienced frame rate drops in the urban areas like downtown Boston or from the roof of the Corvega assembly plant. However, after digging around some forums, I learned that if you turn the shadow distance down to medium or lower, those issues largely go away. But it's crazy that I even had to resort to that. At least it was something that I could fix without downloading mods, but come on. One more thing I should mention about graphic settings with PC is apparently you pretty much have to have weapon debris turned off, otherwise you'll almost certainly experience game crashes on PC. I don't know if it's dependent on what brand of graphics card you have, but I was definitely experiencing a lot of game crashes with my RTX card before I turned that setting off, so. PSA out there, turn that setting off. Once I had that all figured out, I found myself having a great time. 
I eased up on my criticism about the dialogue system because the character interactions still function just fine, and if I really wanted to know what my character's exact response would be, there's a mod to make that happen. There's a nice variety of interesting and colorful characters in the game, and some interactions with these characters are memorable and fun. Except, of course, when that stupid kid gives you a walking tour of Vault 81. I thought maybe you might want someone to show you around. Just five caps. Okay. Give me the tour, Austin. Yes! I got Fine. I don't know why I agreed to this. <laughs> Too nice to the stupid fucking kids. Now we gotta go downstairs. That's where the diner is. It's uh, what have I done? <laughs> this is exciting gameplay. Next stop, Horatio. Let's go see Grin. Next stop, Miss Katie. This is the school. Anything I can loot in here, kid? Failed? What? Someday, I'm gonna check out What? If my grand lets me. Failed? <laughs> what the fuck, man? What, I was just standing too far away from him? I literally followed him everywhere. Is that the last save I had? No! Oh! Yeah, I mean, not every character interaction is a winner, but there's still plenty of intriguing people to encounter in Fallout 4. While there is fun to be had with the characters in the dialogue, that's also not really one of the main sources of enjoyment that I've been having with my current playthrough. There are a lot of different systems and gameplay mechanics to engage with in Fallout 4, and some of these systems work better than others. Thankfully, since it's a big open world game, I've learned that I can kind of just minimize time spent on the stuff I don't like as much and focus my play style on the things that better suit my preferences. The elements of the game that I've been connecting the most with are exploration, atmosphere, gunplay, crafting, and of course, looting. By focusing my time on these things, I've been having a better time than I did on my early playthrough attempts. Any great character moments or dialogue is just a nice bonus as far as I'm concerned, because it's not really one of the big draws for me. I'm sure there are people out there who prioritize character and story above all and are more critical of those aspects of Fallout 4, but those things kind of aren't really as much of a big deal for me. And hey, I'm the one making the video, so I'll just speak from what I know. So with that little disclaimer, let's take a deeper dive into the elements of Fallout 4 that I think work really well. Once you're out of the vault and exploring the wasteland of the Commonwealth, it really feels like there are infinite possibilities out there. That of course isn't exactly true, but it's a cool feeling to have when you start the game. I think the map is well designed and lends itself nicely to a playstyle where I just look around to see something interesting in the distance and then I'll just walk toward it and see what happens. Almost assuredly there will be something worthwhile to discover along the way, whether it's a treasure stash, community of friendly settlers, an intense enemy encounter, or even a massive hidden underground area. There are lots of cool little moments of environmental storytelling that hint at other stories of human struggle and survival in the post-apocalypse. One moment that sticks out to me is when I found an area of derelict buildings near Malden, Mass. I fended off a death claw and then explored an abandoned old middle school, only to discover that underneath the school was an entire vault with nefarious experiments going on. I'm sure there was some sort of quest item that you could find that might lead you there, but the fact that this was a discovery I made on my own was really rewarding. The atmosphere of the game world is another aspect of Fallout 4 that enhances the exploration. The dynamic weather system can completely change the feel of an area. Walking around during broad daylight has a much different feel than when it's cloudy, nighttime, or filled with that radioactive fog. Not only do these weather effects look great, but they really add to the immersion and sense of place, as well as just spicing things up a bit and keeping things from feeling a little too monotonous. When you combine this atmosphere with the Diamond City radio station and wonderful retro pop soundtrack, the game really feels special. It's the kind of vibe that is often imitated, but rarely done as well as it is in the Fallout games. It's also the element that is sorely missing from Starfield. When it comes down to it, I just love the feeling I often get while exploring the post-apocalyptic Commonwealth in Fallout 4. There's also a wonderful sense of danger when walking around the open world. What the fuck? A mole rat that self-destructed? What in the fuck? Many enemies you encounter, such as rad roaches, ghouls, and raiders, aren't too threatening and can usually be easily dispatched. However, sometimes you're minding your own business and then you get attacked by a mutated bear. Oh, a death claw, a behemoth. That's a living thing? What? Oh. 
a robot who can vaporize you in a single hit. A super mutant who shoots mini nukes. An enclave soldier with power armor. Oh my God, what in the fuck? Or perhaps most dangerous of all, a fucking giant mosquito that barely flinches when taking a hit from a fucking missile launcher. Then. It's a success. The mosquito is dead. But Roy must make sure. Knowing that there are some legitimate threats out and about keeps me on my toes as I explore and adds a layer of emergent gameplay to the otherwise scripted quests. These widespread threats lead to some thrilling white knuckle battles that hit you when you least expect. Speaking of battles, let's talk about guns, specifically gun crafting and the upgrade system. Thankfully, Fallout 4 ditches the whole weapon condition and repair mechanic that was in Fallout 3 and instead features modular weapons that can be customized with an impressive amount of options and upgrades. Most parts of nearly any weapon can be modded to increase damage, improve accuracy, reduce recoil, change ammo type, and so on. It can definitely feel a little overwhelming at first, but it didn't take me too long to get the hang of it. I messed around with weapon upgrades a little bit on my second playthrough attempt, but on this current playthrough I leaned into it a lot more. I can easily see how some players wouldn't enjoy this part of the game, but I kind of love it. I spend way too much time messing around with the weapon upgrades and inventory management, which makes for some very compelling content while live streaming. I'm not going to scrap the... If you want to see more of this exciting, high-octane content, check me out over on Twitch. Anyway, I like that I can craft all my weapons toward the playstyle I prefer, which for me is mostly semi-automatic pistols and rifles, as well as sniper rifles and shotguns. I pretty much avoided automatic weapons because they chew through ammo and are just less fun to use, unless I'm blasting away a deathclaw with a minigun. But yeah, the weapon upgrade system is good and fun. One of the benefits of this system is that it doesn't cost caps to make upgrades, and instead cost resources that come straight from the junk that you find scattered all over the world. This of course adds importance to another mechanic of the game. One thing that is always present in a Bethesda game is junk, and lots of it. Food, silverware, tools, toys, trash, bones, clothes, and so on can be found littered across almost every surface and in every container in the game. Sure, in previous Fallout and Elder Scrolls games, some of this junk could be used for healing or crafting or whatever, but in Fallout 4, almost every piece of junk that isn't bolted down can be used as a raw material for crafting weapons, armor, buildings, turrets, etc. This makes looting more interesting because sometimes finding a desk fan is more valuable than finding money, because the fan contains a screw that can be used to add a new barrel or scope to your current weapon. It somehow adds excitement to finding seemingly useless crap. Shit, I get fired up every time I find a roll of duct tape or a bottle of glue because adhesive material is so valuable for weapon upgrades. Find a bag of concrete or a cinder block? Fuck yeah, dude. That shit is clutch for base building. This loot slash crafting system coincides well with the general theme of post-apocalyptic survival, because it really feels like every small bit of material you find can be used to help increase the odds of surviving in such a harsh environment. Fallout 4 somehow makes it fun to swipe pens and pencils from desks or children's toys from old containers. Earlier, I talked about the improved looting system introduced in Fallout 4, and it's a particularly welcome change because of the big role that finding junk has in the game. I can totally see how this entire mechanic might be annoying for some players, but me? I think it's a pretty cool layer to add on top of everything else that's going on. Another big thing that looting junk helps with is the building system. In my first attempts of Fallout 4, I didn't really engage with the building system at all. It felt a little janky and wasn't really what I thought I wanted out of an action RPG. Weirdly enough, it wasn't until I dipped my toes in Fallout 76 and built a base in that game until I really could see the possibilities of building stuff. So when I came back to Fallout 4 after playing Fallout 76, I decided, you know, why not build a little fort for myself and deck it out with some stylish flourishes? And of course, plenty of cat posters to go around. This is definitely an optional thing that you don't really need to do if you don't want to, and the build system itself is still a little rough around the edges, 
but it's a nice change of pace from the rest of the game. Sometimes it's fun to just take a little break from the shooting and looting to make something nice for yourself. I built a beautiful scrap metal house with a basketball hoop, barbecue grill, soda mixer, disco ball, radiation king television, neon sign of my name, bobblehead display, cigarette machine, and a mounted machine gun turret. You know, pretty much everything you'd want in a home. I also made a separate building to store my power armor. This is a work in progress, so don't judge it too hard. But yeah, I didn't really think this was something I was going to spend a lot of time on, but once I started, I found it hard to stop. All of these gameplay elements I've been describing are big reasons why the game is clicking for me. But it's time to talk about the icing on the cake. Let's talk about one of my favorite things in the game. I enjoy the finer things in life. I consider myself a man of complex taste. I like things that are smart and well-written that challenge and enhance my worldview. At the same time, I'm also a simple man. Sometimes I just want to see a crazy head explosion. And boy oh boy, this game provides those in spades. I get fired up every time there's an eruption of over-the-top cartoonish gore. Oh. Oh yeah. Goodbye. Oh. <laughs> My God. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Damn. Holy shit, that was sick. Oh. Damn. <laughs> oh my god i would have assumed this would get old after a while but somehow it never does it's not just the blood and gore the fire effects and explosions can be a good time too it's never a bad idea to throw a molotov cocktail into any situation to spice things up but then you had to get all sentimental all that stupid crap about the old times. Dala, I'm handling this. Skinny Malone's always got things under control. Skinny Malone's got things under control. So much for Skinny Malone. The fire, lasers, mini nuke explosions, and violent decapitations definitely make for an enjoyable experience. I know I'm probably part of the problem with our society, but I just can't help it. This stuff is hilarious to me. When you sprinkle that gore onto the smooth gunplay and VATS system of Fallout 4, you end up with some pretty satisfying combat. The blood splatter also provides feedback when you fire your weapons and makes it really feel like you're doing some serious damage. I think the game probably still works if they didn't have this extreme gore, but also, I don't know. It adds funny and unexpected moments to a game that might get a little stale without it. It's an amusing and sneakily important factor in my enjoyment of Fallout 4. Fallout 4 is fascinating to me because it's really good, but it might not seem that way at first because it shoots itself in the foot due to a bevy of issues. I didn't particularly care for it at first, but I couldn't fully give up on it either. I think I had this feeling that there might be something there I would like, so I gave the game more chances than I normally would with games I don't really like. There were many appealing things about it that gave me FOMO, whether it was the atmosphere, dark humor, gunplay, or simply the fact that there was a Fallout game that takes place in fucking Boston, kid. Then again, how could I enjoy any of those things if the game didn't work properly? In the end, the game requires patience and perseverance to figure out how to get working well, whether it's digging through online forums to find the right graphics settings or downloading mods to compensate for the subpar optimization. Even with a powerful modern PC, it still takes some tinkering to get performing adequately the way it should have out of the box in 2015. It's a real shame that it takes this kind of effort just to play the game normally. I know that for a lot of people who play video games, they don't need things running at a smooth frame rate and might not even notice or care when the game stutters. But one of my playthroughs also suffered from a game-breaking bug, which isn't acceptable even for the most casual gamer. 
It took enthusiasm and a positive mindset to work through those shortcomings. And the only reason I had that kind of positivity is because I enjoyed the Fallout TV show. The show provided just enough goodwill to get me over the hump with Fallout 4, and I'm happy that it did. But frankly, no game should require this amount of work and tinkering in order to be enjoyable. Fallout 4 is an enormous open world game with lots of different mechanics. Not all of those things are equally fun, and depending on their taste, people will play this game in a variety of different ways. Once I settled into the playstyle I like, namely sneaking around, exploring the dangerous wasteland, loading up on loot and sniping raider heads off, I started having a blast. I'm basically playing this game more as a looter shooter than a story heavy RPG, and if you're someone who is looking for a more pure role playing game, I imagine you probably prefer the original Fallout games and New Vegas over Fallout 4. And I totally get that. A big reason why this game is so divisive is because your enjoyment of it is dependent on what you want to get out of it. As an open world survival shooter, I think it's good fun. I'm over 50 hours into my current playthrough and I've been sticking with it mostly due to the addictive gameplay loop of shooting, looting, and crafting. Every time I thought I was done with Fallout 4, it kept pulling me back in. But then there was always a good reason for me to bounce off of it. Nine years after the game first arrived, I eventually conjured up enough patience and positivity to get it working, which allowed me to find my groove. I haven't finished the game yet, and who knows if I'll stay long enough to see it through to the end, but considering the amount of fun I've already had, I can confidently say that it was worth it. For fun, I'm going to do this. Ready? <laughs> oh, God. There you have it. Thanks for watching. Let me know in the comments if your opinion about Fallout 4 has changed over the years. I'd be curious to know if any of you experienced a similar journey with this or any other Fallout game. If you liked this video, I'd very much appreciate it if you hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. I've got several other game reviews on there, as well as some other comedy and music projects. I also do some live streaming twice a week on Twitch, so come on over sometime and say hi. I'm hoping to make more videos like this in the future, so keep an eye out for that. Until next time, have a good one. And of course, smell you later.